Good morning, Reach Church. How you doing this morning? Come on, stand to your feet. If you're watching online, we're so glad you're with us this morning. We miss you here, but we're glad at least you get to watch. Come on, you guys ready to praise God in this house this morning? You ready to experience His presence? Okay, half of you are. We'll get the rest of you there. We'll get you awake. God, we thank you and praise you for who you are. We say come and have it the praises of your people in this building and watching online. God, I thank you that you just move in this place this morning. Come on, if you believe it, say amen. If you want to come down to the front to worship, you can. Come on, you guys ready to worship God? Come on. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Come on. Is the only way for me. It's narrow road that leads to life, but I wanna be on it. It's a narrow road, but the mercy is wide, cause you're good on your promise. I'll take you at your way. Your grace is all. 
grace is always enough. The enemy is a liar. He's attacking and we're gonna respond. So many times we allow demonic activity to have the last say when God says no. No, 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 you gotta let me have the last say because he comes in and he redeems what the enemy meant to destroy. He comes in, redeems what the enemy meant to take you out. And we're gonna sing and declare, and I feel so much faith in this room this morning. I'm gonna be honest with you, last week I felt heaviness, but today I feel so much faith rising in this room. I believe we're starting to understand that he who says that he began a good work in us is faithful to complete that work that God is doing something, that this church believes that He is a miracle working God, that He was signs and wonders. Follow them that believe. Come on, let's sing it out this morning. You set your love. You set your love, never give up. You set your grace is always enough. You set your heart, never of our praise and our worship. God, you are so worthy of all. God, I thank you that we have a sound mind, God, that we hear only the things that you want us to hear. That God, we speak only the things that you want us to speak, Holy Spirit. God, I thank you for what you're doing in this room this morning. And God, you're silencing the chaos. I take authority over every spirit that has been attacking people. You know your name and I call you out in Jesus' mighty name. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that only spirit that's welcome in this room is you and you alone in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, come and move in this room. Come and move in this place. Come and do what only you can do. Keep rolling. God, I thank you that you are all things good. And God, if we have forgotten how good you are, that God, you remind us today. That it be a remembrance of your faithfulness and your goodness. And we speak out that we have a sound mind in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Trauma will not have the last say in the name of Jesus. Oh, the things that have happened to us will not have the last say. God, you will have the last say in everything that has to do with our lives. If you're in this place this morning and you need someone to speak over you, pray over you, we have our prayer team in the back. They have white lanyards on. They would love to pray over you. If you're online, I want you to send it in so our staff can pray and intercede on your behalf. Church, you're gonna be called to intercede for some people. There are gonna be times when you feel a heaviness and it's not a heaviness from the enemy. It's when the Holy Spirit brings you something 
to pray through. Paul said it was like groanings of a woman in childbirth. And there are times when I am in my car and I begin to feel that and I'll begin weeping for our church. Why? Because the Holy Spirit knows where he wants to take us. I can't pray those things out in the natural. So I begin to pray in the spirit to allow God to begin to move and work in things that I cannot see, that he sees. And there are things that you're gonna pray through for your family and for people. And we've gotta lean into that prayer. We've gotta lean into intercession and allow God to do what only he can do. God, I thank you that you move in this room right now, that you're meeting needs. You're speaking peace. God, let your love permeate. God, you just love us. You are madly in love with us. And I thank you, God, that we can sit and rest in the fact that you are father first before savior. That God, we come to you as father and then you give us a ring and a robe and you save us and you bring us in. But God, I thank you that we don't forget first that you are our father. And today we're singing to you. Today, Father, your children are singing to you and worshiping you right now. In the chaos, you are the peace. In my suffering, you're here with me. In the darkness, you never leave. God of mercy, you're walking with me. I surrender anxiety. All the striving has to cease. In this moment, you're still the king. This is the gift you are giving to me. A sound mind for the spirit of fear. A sound mind so that I can see clearly. A sound mind, your spirit is here. A sound mind, a sound mind. A sound mind. There's a table where we of my enemies I will listen and I will feast on every word you are speaking to me I remember who you are you're my fortress and my God I will stand in authority in Jesus name all this darkness will flee a sound my sound mind so that I can see clearly a sound mind your spirit is here a sound mind a sound mind a sound mind for the spirit of fear a sound mind so that I can see clearly a sound mind your spirit is here a sound mind a sound a table where we meet it's in the presence of my enemies I will listen and I will feast on every word you are speaking come on I remember who you are you're my fortress and my God I will stand in authority name all this darkness will flee a sound mind for the spirit of fear a sound mind so that i can see clearly a sound mind your spirit is here a sound mind a sound mind a sound mind for the spirit of fear a sound mind so that i can see clearly a sound mind, your spirit is here. 
I shouldn't be dealing with this or this is this is too bad or this is I, I, I should be further along than this I thought those things and there's been moments where I've been shameful of what I walked through but when we see it as Jesus stepping into our darkness and calling us out of that darkness and into the light there is no more shame there's not shame in that that is resurrection power so right now, whatever situation you're thinking of that you just feel shameful about, God is wanting to break that off. He's wanting to remind you that I have called you out of that. I have called you out of that darkness. I have called your name to step into my light and there is no shame. There is only fullness of joy, fullness of salvation, fullness of my peace and my authority to step over that shame, to call out that shame and say, no, not here, not here. You don't get to reside here because Jesus has called me out. Sing this out with me this morning. Sing it to yourself. No more hiding and no more shame. You've stepped in my darkness and called my name. No more hiding and no more shame. You stepped in my darkness and called my name. No more hiding and no more shame. You stepped in my darkness and called my name. No more hiding and no more shame. You stepped in my darkness and called my name. There's no more hiding, no more shame. You stepped in my darkness and called my name. No more hiding and no more shame. You stepped in my darkness and called my name. No more hiding and no more shame. You stepped in my darkness and called my name. No more hiding and no more shame. You stepped in my darkness. You step in my darkness. You step in my darkness. Bring your light. You step in my darkness. And you bring your light. You step in my darkness. Bring your light A sound mind for the spirit of fear A sound mind so that I can see clearly A sound mind, a spirit is here A sound mind, a sound mind A sound mind for the spirit of fear A sound mind so that I can see a sound mind, your spirit is here. A sound mind, a sound mind. And what can wash? 
your church attendance it's not the amount of scriptures you read it's not the work and the effort that you do to get yourself right it's one thing it's the pure precious blood of Jesus Christ that makes you whole calls you worthy it's the grace of God who rescues you and steps in Can we take this just a moment? Plea, this is my plea. And thank nothing, him. Nothing but the blood. That he provided something sufficient for your sin. That he provided something that was sufficient enough to give you a call and a purpose. That he gave you something that was sufficient enough to put you in relationship with him. Father, help us understand the revelation of what your blood did. That the purity of your blood made us righteous again. We thank you. That although sometimes we not, may not feel like we're righteous, we thank you that because of your blood, you ensure that we are. 
we love you. We thank you for the work of redemption. We thank you for the work of what the body of Christ did on Calvary. Come on, just think about it today that you have been made right because of Jesus. There is now no one righteous. Everyone is filthy as rags until, until Jesus. So Father, we thank you. We praise you. We give you glory and honor. Let our lives, God, declare to the world of your of your love, of your compassion, of your restoring power. Come on, let's think about it when you were in your worst state, when you were in your deepest, loneliest, depressed state, that Jesus showed up for you. So Father, we love you, we thank you that we stand in righteousness because of who you are and what you've done. Come on, find somebody this morning and just say, hey, I want you to know you're way more righteous than you may realize. I mean, really find somebody, because somebody doesn't believe it in the room this morning. Good to see all of you righteous, beautiful people this morning. Come on, if you're righteous, give me an amen. If you're beautiful, give me an amen. All right, we lost half the church there. All of you all are beautiful. We got the best looking church in Northwest Arkansas. Amen? Yeah. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, if you're new to church, welcome to, welcome to church. This is how we do church. And we love Jesus with all of our hearts. And we are honored to have you. If you are, maybe this is your first time, maybe this is your fourth time, fifth time. We want to welcome you. And uh, let's just honor them this morning and thank them for showing up. Uh, love for you to check out the guest calendar, get to know somebody, and uh, we're honored to have you. We want you to know that you're not just a number, uh, that you have a calling, you have a purpose, you have a destiny, that God wants to do something in your life this morning. Amen? And uh, so anyway, we would love for you to, to, to get to know us and let us do life together. Uh, second thing, if you are a man, let me hear your alpha roar. All right, we got two people. <laughs> no, all you men, come on, at the Razorback game, if you were there yesterday, you would have been, you know, doing your biggest woo pig suey, right? You can't even do woo pig suey and sound like a man. It's like, woo, <laughs> you know, it's kind of awkward. It's like, awesome. But if you're a man, we got Legacy next Saturday at 11. 11. We're going to do a chili uh, competition. And at uh, 11 p.m., we're going to watch the game, the Razorbacks destroy Alabama, right? <laughs> because they're so good. And uh, anyway, uh, come join us, and uh, we would love to, to just get to know you. I believe that the church is as successful as, as we are as a community, that the more we are as men and women are joined in community, the more powerful we are as a church. And that's what Acts Church, that's what happened, is that men and women got together, they did life together, and that's what impacted the region and the area. So come be a part of it. We would love to, uh, uh, again, just to hang out with you and uh, watch the Razorbacks win. <laughs> I'm in full hope and expectation. Amen. All right. We have been in this new series um, kind of... Uh, it, it's these really tough topics. In fact, some of the sermons that I'm going to share, I personally have never heard people preach about. Um, and I'm not preaching them because I want to be the guy that preached them. I feel like after a, I've been in ministry over 20 years now, and looking at people's lives and sitting in meetings that I've sat in, and, and looking at the different things that people have faced, these are things that are pretty consistent that, I, that we, we have to have conversations around. And I think that these are heavy, and I think that these are necessary to help you have some theology and doctrine on how Jesus thinks and sees and how he views certain aspects. And so last week, we talked about forgiveness. We talked about unforgiveness. And I, I, we, you know, we, we gave space for you to, you know, if you were holding an unforgiveness, that to, you know, we know the, the scripture doctrine talked about what is forgiveness. It's letting, it's letting go. 
That's what forgiveness is. It's letting go. What is unforgiveness? It's holding. It's not letting go, right? And so that was one of those. And so if you haven't listened to it, I would encourage you to go listen to it. Uh, because it's not about necessarily that you have unforgiveness now. It's, there's going to be an opportunity for unforgiveness. Every, every one of you will have an opportunity because God, let me say this, our, the, the counselor that I see, one day I went in and I was telling him about something that was going on in my life. He says, Satan's faithful. And it caught me off guard. I, I was waiting for him to say, God's faithful. He said, Satan's faithful. And I was like, dude, that is a, like, boom, that's good. Because here's the deal. Satan's faithful. You will have an opportunity to have unforgiveness. And uh, so this, this morning, I want to talk about something that is probably even a little bit more heavy, but even more necessary, and that is shame. And it's from the very beginning is where we see it pop up in Scripture, from the very beginning. And so we're going to read chapters, uh, we're going to read Genesis chapter 3, where Adam and Eve are, are given these instructions to not do something, they do it, and then the repercussions of that. And so many of you are familiar with this passage um, but just because you're familiar with the passage doesn't mean that you understand fully what is it, what's it saying in there and how to deal with shame. How, how does shame, how does shame work? Uh, and, and although you've experienced it, just because you've experienced something on an iPhone, you don't know how it works in detail, right? Um, you know, if, if just cause you get in your car, it doesn't mean you know how it works. You just know that you start the key and you move. Right, like just there are certain things that just because you've experienced shame doesn't mean you know how to get out of shame. You don't know how it works and how it functions. And so I want to have a conversation around that this morning uh, because I believe that many of you did come in this morning feeling shame, some sense of shame, or you've felt shame, and shame sometimes has this ability to come back all of a sudden. So Genesis chapter 3, we're going to read it, and I'm going to read through a few verses, maybe through 10 or so, 11 verses. It says, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. The woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. She wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it, and then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At the moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord among the trees. And then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden. So I hid, I was afraid because I was naked. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for helping us see how the enemy works. And God, I thank you for allowing us to see also how you work in the middle of shame. So Father, I thank you that you would help us this morning, God, while we navigate shame. God, I thank you that it is your desire to allow us to be freed from that. And so God, I thank you for helping us this morning walk in a new level of freedom so that we can ultimately make you more famous today than you were yesterday. Come on, if you believe that, you can say amen. If you're writing notes, you can... This is the title, Shame Off Me. Shame off you, actually. Shame off you. And because, you know, as, as you look at this, it's, you know, you've ever been, you ever been held against your will? You ever been, like, even as a kid, like, if I take Jay from the moment she was little, we couldn't wrap her in, you know how you swaddle babies? Not my day, my, not my Jaylee. No, you can swaddle Anaya, but you can't swaddle Jaylee. Even to this day, if you restrict Jaylee, she will freak out. She hates being held against her will. I don't know if you've ever felt that, but in essence, that's what shame is. Shame is you being held against your will. You know, we talked about forgiveness, and forgiveness is, is letting go. Unforgiveness is not letting go. And forgiveness is when you don't let somebody go. Shame is when it doesn't let you go. 
See, shame works against you while unforgiveness may work against somebody else. See, shame holds you captive. It tells you you're not worthy. It tells you you deserve this. It tells you God will never love you. It tells you that your spouse or your friends or those relationships or those circumstances that you aren't valued. And here in this passage, I'm sure that if you've lived long enough as a believer, you felt moments of shame where you didn't feel worthy to be in a church service, lifting your hands in freedom. Because while you were lifting your, your hands in freedom, trying to be free, the enemy was trying to hold you against your will. Trying to tell you, you're not worthy, you don't deserve to be in God's presence, he doesn't like people like you. Anybody ever felt that in the room? Anybody ever felt shame where you've done something, you've looked at something, you've reacted a certain way, and you did something, and immediately something happens to you, and you feel like you're being held against your will? That's what shame is. Shame is, and here's the thing, shame doesn't knock on the door. Shame busts down the door and says, you're coming with me. And you, because you feel like you deserve it, you go and you follow and you allow shame to handcuff you. Because ultimately you feel like you deserve to be handcuffed. Because look what you did. Now we all know that, we all know that we've experienced shame and what it's felt, but how do we disarm shame? Because that is the art of getting out and living in a freedom that God has called us to, is how do we get free from shame? Because shame's gonna come tomorrow, at some point when you least expect it, shame's gonna knock down the door, try to handcuff you against your will and say, you deserve this, I have a warrant to your arrest. See, shame is powerful. Shame has this ability to make you hide, make you not be who you really are. When somebody wants to find out a little bit about you, we make sure that shame tells you, don't tell them that. Don't, they're, you know, don't be that person. And here we see these two people that we know and we've heard about and we kind of builds our theology and doctrine around, right? Uh, that, that they made some major mistakes. In fact, it would change our lives. This story ultimately changed your and my life. Imagine the shame that you would feel if you changed all of humanity. The weight of humanity changing because of a decision you made. Imagine the shame that you feel as a dad or a mom or a friend and when you affect somebody else's life. It gets weighty, right? It's one thing if I make a decision and it's just me and I don't have a family and I don't have friends and I don't have a life. That's different. But the reality is none of us have that. Some of you may not have very many friends, (laughs) I'm kidding. It's a heavy topic. Let's laugh a little bit. But here we see that as soon as this, this is interesting. It says, at the moment that their eyes were opened, they suddenly felt shame. Notice the emotion of shame, how quick it came. It didn't creep up. The first thing that showed up Suddenly, there's two types of suddenlies, right? There's the suddenly in Acts 2, which we love, and then there's the suddenly here where shame comes up and says, hey, you're coming with me. The spirit came to liberate in Acts 2, and here the shame came to isolate. He said their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame. Felt shame. See, shame is a feeling. But shame is a feeling that's real. Like sometimes we know that certain feelings, it's like, okay, that's just being dramatic. Shame is a real feeling that the enemy gives you to try to isolate you, to try to tell you, you need to run. But this is such a beaut- there's such a beautiful aspect of this. When we see shame and when we make our mistakes, when we make bad decisions, when we've done something we shouldn't have done, and then we see the redemptive power of Christ. And here we, we see that, that it says that they, they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. The one thing about that, that, that as soon as they, they made this decision, shame doesn't wait. Shame just like, it, boom, it comes in. There's not any other emotion there. It says immediately they felt shame. 
Immediately when you make a bad decision, what does the enemy know? He's waiting for, he will, do you realize that the enemy is, he's telling them, do this, do this, do this. Hey, this is what you should deserve. This is what you should do. This is what you should do. And then the moment they do it, he's waiting for them. It's like, steal that piece of candy. Steal that piece of candy. You're going to love that piece of candy. Take it, take it. So you, I got to arrest you because you stole. That's how shame works. Shame is, in, it's, it's fueled by Satan and then he holds you hostage by the very thing he told you to do. That's how shame works. And here we see that, that, you know, there is nothing you can obtain in your own power to hide from shame, right? But, but here's the first point that I want to kind of set up. Because we see that, that as soon as they felt shame, it says that they covered themselves and then they tried to hide. And shame will get you to run from who can restore you. The very one that can actually restore and redeem them is, they, is the one that they choose to run from. How many times have you felt shame and said, I don't want to go to church today. I don't want to open my Bible today. I don't, I, don't, I'm not, I don't deserve to pray. I don't deserve to sit in the presence of God. The very one that can actually restore, heal, redeem is the one that oftentimes shame tells us we're not worthy to be in the presence of. Right? And then right after that, it says this, that they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Because we'll go to extreme measures to try to cover up shame. We'll do extreme things to try to cover it up, to keep it down the DL, to do whatever we can to justify it. We'll do whatever we can in the natural. Notice these are fig leaves. These are natural things. That they're grabbing something in the natural to try to cope with the shame that they're dealing with. It may be for you, a bottle of whatever. It may be a pill. It may be something even deeper. See, it's amazing. Shame will take you into deeper places. Shame doesn't just settle for, oh, you did this tree thing. No, it leads you into deeper and deeper and darker things. So here's my question. I always have a question for you. How are you hiding? How are you hiding? What is your fig leaves? Is it a TV show that you can veg out on and if you can just keep your mind off of what it is that you're feeling shame about, you can just sedate the shame? But I want you to know that shame wakes up as soon as, you, as, soon as you're done watching the show, drinking the alcohol, popping the pill, whatever it may be for you, spending all the time you want with that relationship, it's waiting for you. Shame is relentless. It doesn't let you go until you take authority of it. See, maybe you're hiding with busy work. I think that's what a lot of us do. If I can just stay busy and keep my, keep my body active, keep my mind going, right? Maybe it's success. If I can just be successful, I can justify the shame away. Right? We do these things. This is how we hide. Maybe it's sports for you. Maybe you're just sports. Maybe it's like the per your personality. You're like, I'm just, an out I'm just an outgoing person, and you use that to your advantage. There's a lot of different ways to hide, but here's the question is, how are you hiding? They chose to hide with fig leaves. But here's another thing that I want you to get. They actually never hid. The Lord knew where they were the whole time. And while you may be trying to hide, the Bible says that he knows all of our secrets. You're hiding from you, but you're certainly not hiding from God. But shame will convince you that you're safe. Your little secret is safe with you. And we see that, that there are different ways to hide. See, here's the power of shame is that the enemy knows he has the, the knowledge that he has, he uses it against you. The knowledge that he had over Adam and Eve, he used against them. That's the problem with shame, is that while you can hide it and you can have the secret, the enemy knows about it. So while you are in the dark, the enemy is in the dark with you. Shame is there because the enemy knows that little secret. He knows those things about you. 
And you can figure, I'll just get busy. I'll get into sports. I'll get into this. I'll do that. I'll do this. I'll create another hobby. Can I tell you that shame is waiting on the other side of all of those things? See, shame will get you to run from the very thing that can restore you. Shame isn't a matter of time. You can have the thing that you have shame about when you were 10 years old can be with you when you're 50 years old. Shame grows with you until you let it go. Until you release it, until you allow the power of Christ to restore you and, and redeem you, you can, have, you can have that same thing for years. I think a lot of us think we'll grow out of shame. No, no, you are restored out of shame. You were redeemed out of shame. See, shame will always look for another way other than the truth, which creates a more significant level of shame. Oh, I'll cover myself with fig leaves. Oh, I'll distance myself from the Lord because he usually walks this area over here. I'll make sure that I go over there. See, there's always different ways that we try to hide around the truth of shame. I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll do this. And then it's like for a moment it feels like, oh, it fixed it. Right? Ultimately to find out that shame is still there. Shame will talk you out of your purpose. Shame will talk you out of your goals, causing you to settle for a false identity. Notice that these two are created to procreate and to create humanity. And in this moment, all they care about is hiding and covering themselves. Not to be intimate with each other, not to, to, to walk through this thing together and say, hey, what happened here? We're feeling this way. We need to go find God because we obviously feel this way and we are naked and we didn't know we could be naked and I don't know what is going on here, right? Like, that is what really happens is that, that you've got to understand that the whole goal of shame is to convince you and talk you out that you're, you've ruined your purpose, I remember being a young man, being passionate about ministry and making terrible decisions and ultimately thinking, my purpose and calling is over. I've messed up too much to ultimately realize that God was waiting to restore me and I didn't, because of the bad decisions I've made, shame was trying to talk me out of the identity that God had for me. And I want you to know that that is no different for you, that you may have a calling that is significant. You, I would let me say this again. You have a calling. You have a purpose. And shame will try to misidentify and tell you you're not worthy to do that anymore. And you have to allow what happens here in a moment happen, and that's to allow Jesus to come in and restore. See, shame, what does it do? Is shame shapes an unhealthy perspective of God, of how you view God and how God views you. See, it's not just about how I think I see God, but it's also a shame will make me think about how God views me. Think about it from your own experience. When you felt shame, God doesn't want me anymore. Isn't that always the MO of shame? God doesn't want me anymore. God can't have me this way. God is not okay with me anymore. That's the MO of shame. Shame always shows up and tells you, God doesn't like you anymore. You've messed up too much. That was there, there in this moment. We're, we're experiencing the first moment of anybody ever feeling shame. And this is their, they didn't have any, anybody else to follow suit. Like they didn't get trained this way. This is just what happens. This is what happens when sin enters our lives there's a huge difference between conviction, which we all need. And if we aren't having conviction when we're in sin, you are in way more dangerous of a position than you could ever imagine. But there's a huge difference between conviction and condemnation. There's a huge difference between conviction and shame. But notice that the first thing that came was shame, not conviction. Conviction opened their eyes and let them see that they were naked. But what was the next thing? Shame. Suddenly they felt shame. Shame overrode their conviction and kept them overplaying. I deserve this. Look at me. I'm going to have to just deal with this lifestyle and I'm going to have to I'm gonna cover up myself the way that I feel I need to cover up myself. He says this. 
So they hid from the Lord among the trees. Then the Lord God called the man to the man, where are you? Do you think God didn't know where he was? That's a, that's a good theological question, right? Does God know where you're at? Does God know the shame that you're dealing with? Does God know the sin that you're struggling in? Because sometimes we don't think that he does. It's like, oh, I need to. Repentance is not for him to know. It's for you to know that you did it wrong and that you need a savior. It's not like God was like, oh my gosh, you ate from the tree? Right? No, he knew the moment that they did it. And this is another thing that I love about God is that he didn't show up as soon as it happened. He had to let them work out their own thing. And in that moment, it's like, I'm going to give them space, and then I'm going to show up. See, what are the areas of shame? I was just thinking about areas of shame that I've experienced in different ways. Not, these are not all of them, but some of them are mine, emotional reactions. When I've overreacted to somebody, and I acted, I responded to a certain person, whether it be my wife, a friend, coworker, whatever it may be, and I kind of went at them. And that after I did that, I always feel shame. Shame comes so quick. Why did you talk to me? I thought you loved God. I thought you were supposed to be full of love. You're a pastor. You know that, right? Those are mine. Those are my echoes in my mind. I'm like, and then sometimes, you know, because I feel that, I, I even go more. I get more angry or I get more frustrated. But those emotional reactions, they get me. You know, I'm one of those types of personalities. I've got a strong personality. And so, like, I, I can just get that way. And I've had to learn that about myself, that hold on. That's my, that's my def- I need to be careful that that's not my default. Maybe it's your spiritual devotional life. You feel shame. You say, okay, God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to get into my life with you and devotionally. I'm going to be committed. I'm going to be consistent. And then you do it one time and you haven't looked at your Bible in another month. You feel shame because your devotional life isn't consistent. Your spiritual journey is all about Sunday morning and that's it. But here it's not that shame is not always wrong in the sense of what it's revealing to you. It's just wrong as in you letting it be the controller of you. Because if you are feeling shame then in, in, in your spiritual journey, in your spiritual life, in, in those things, it's not that you just ignore it, you confront it. Why am I feeling this way? Because I'm not consistent in my time with the Lord. Maybe it's some past choices that you've had. You're like, man, I can't believe I did that. It's amazing how the past decisions can still bring up current shame, present shame. In the middle of a right now moment, shame will make you try to live out a past experience. So what do you do with that? How do you conquer those things? We're going to talk about that. But maybe finances, you feel shame about how you've handled finance. You're like, God, I'm going to be debt free and now you're, you're older than you thought. You're still living in debt and you've gotten more debt. You maybe filed bankruptcy. You've made some terrible decisions financially. You've hurt other people because of your finances and you feel shame. See, shame comes in all shapes and sizes. And for some of us, there are certain areas that we get shamed the most. This is where it hits us the most. Maybe it's the way that, that you, you lied to somebody. You feel shame about it. You told them a white lie. Is there such a thing? I mean, I guess the white lie would be maybe if like you're like harboring Nazis and you don't want them to get killed and you say, oh, I don't have any Nazis with me. Like, I mean, I don't, I don't have any Jews with me. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> Brianism, oh well. Right, like that lie, that's an okay lie. That's not the kind of lie I'm talking about. <laughs> right? So, I say I was harboring Nazis. That's great. <laughs> cool. I meant you were harboring them from, you were, you were keeping Jews safe from the Nazis. Right? Like, there's different types of lies, but that, that lie is okay. But those other lies that the enemy tells you, that's okay to do. And then all of a sudden you feel shame about it. That's the power of, of, you know, maybe it's the way you treated somebody. It's the way that you 
you, you consistently treat someone and you feel shame about it. There's different types of shame. And I wanted to name some of those so that we understand that there is a plethora of ways to feel shame. Shame isn't just sexual, it's just not spiritual, it's just not relational, it's just not emotional. There are a lot of different ways to experience shame. Verse 12 says, a man replied, it was the young woman who gave this to me, and this may not be up there, and I'm and I apologize for it, but he says, who told you you were naked? And the Lord God asked, have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, I was, it was the woman, and it goes through this whole thing. And they tried to cover themselves up, but here's the powerful thing, is that the Lord shows back up with something to cover them with. And he doesn't make them through do like you need to do 12 jumping jacks, you need to do three cartwheels, you need to do, you know, you know, whatever it is, he shows up because he understands the power of shame and he understands his redemptive role in their lives if they're willing to let him. And for you, it's not about you doing a certain amount of things. You need to come to church, you gotta be consistent, you know, for a month. You can't miss a Sunday. You got to read every, a chapter every single day. You got to pray twice a day, three times a day, actually, because that's what Daniel did. And then you got to, like, do you see what I'm saying? He doesn't do any of that. They mess up. They try to cover themselves. It's insufficient. So God shows up with something that is sufficient called the blood of an animal and then restores and redeems them. That, in essence, is how shame is handled. That is, here's what I'm trying to get at. It doesn't matter what you think you can do to get rid of shame. You can do nothing to get healed of shame. It takes a redeemer. It takes the savior to take away shame. It's not something that you can pay for. It takes, now I'm not saying this. Here's, I feel this, like fine, if I just, if I let the Lord deal with it. No, if you've hurt somebody, you don't just say, I'm going to let the, door, the Lord heal it and deal with it. There are times where you need to ask for forgiveness too. And then in that, God restores that personal relationship. And then the, the, the Lord heals your, your heart in the shame side of it. Sometimes we're like, oh, we try to skirt around talking and having to deal with people and relationships. No, that's not how that works. You still got to have that tough conversation and say, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have reacted that way. I let my emotions get away. And I'm sorry that I did that to you. And then now you're restoring that relationship and also the Lord. But you can't do that until the Lord has first restored you. All right. So we see how this powerful thing plays out. Um, it says this. Let me just read it to you, verse 21. It's not going to be up here. It says, And the Lord God made clothing from an animal skin for Adam and his wife. That is just such a beautiful way of being able to see how much God really does love us, even in our shame, even in our mistakes, even when he, we directly disobey God. He's like, hey, I've got something to cover you, and this will actually cover you. I mean, how many of you know fig leaves were great, but eventually they wear out. <laughs> they break apart. And there are so many things in our lives that we try to cover ourselves up with that eventually they rode, they break up, they're not going to do it. They're just not going to do the job. And so stop, here's what I'm trying to get you to do. Stop covering yourself with something that you're not supposed to cover yourself with. Let the Lord in. And, and this is what we sometimes do with shame. We're like, oh no, I'm good, Lord. Look, I'm, I'm covered. Instead of allowing the Lord to do what he's called to do. Now let's get a little bit more practical in the sense of like, like, let's look at another man's life. And there's different stories throughout Scripture. You know, there's the woman at the well who's been, you know, she's had, you know, five wives. And the guy she's with now, she's not, I mean, she, husband's another one. Great. Oh, man. Lord, you were supposed to anoint this this morning, okay? <laughs> the woman at the well, she's married to, you know, she's had five husbands. And the man she's married with now, she's not married to. And, you know, there's a lot of shame in that, I'm sure, as Jesus is having this conversation. And, and, but what was Jesus' goal in that? To send a woman back to her city free. 
right? Like, there's different situations and different and circumstances that the Lord gives us in Scripture. But here's one, David. Have you ever heard of David, King David? This is the guy that we look up to as like, this guy was a man after God's own heart. Well, this man committed adultery. This man deceived. This man murdered. He did all of those things. And yet, he was considered a man after God's own heart. That's some pretty, like most of us would not let a man like that preach on a church Sunday morning. Be like, um, sir, you deserve to be somewhere else, okay? Not where we get our theology from. But this, as after this, after he's made this decision, he's, you know, he's committed adultery, he's murdered somebody. This is the psalm that he pens, Psalms 51. And he says this, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone I have sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You have proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me, now let me rejoice. Don't keep me don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. And this is where the popular psalm comes out is verse 10. Created me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Don't banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. That's the power of the Holy Spirit working in a man's heart. That's the power of when shame is knocking at the door of your heart saying, you don't deserve that. And Jesus comes in and redeems and restores. What I love about David is that David wrote about it, not knowing maybe that we would get that letter and we would read his story and we would see all of the junk that he did. But ultimately we would also see the heart of a man who understood he was a sinful man and that he made some bad decisions. The second point that I want to share with you is kind of tied to this because you will never defeat shame with secrets. And that's what I love about David. David tried to keep it a secret, but there was a man prophet by the name of Nathaniel who came and, and confronted him. And he could have continued to keep it a secret because he was the king. But he chose to pen it and write it and say, hey, I've got to get my life right. Secrets keep shame. Shame is always hungry. It will eat at you until you confront it. It's always, it's a devouring thing. It will go after you and it will say, hey, it, it will constantly, it will starve you of your life. Shame is hungry. It never stops eating. Until you confront it, until you expose it, it will always assault you. See, you have to know who God is or shame will lie to you about him. You have to know the power of shame. You have to know, you have to know who God is. And if you get God wrong, you'll keep shame. If you don't get a good theology of how God deals and handles and sees shame, then you'll keep it. Shame won't let go of you. It, it won't let go of you. I don't know how long you've been like, okay, man, it's finally going to leave. Shame doesn't let go. You have to let go of shame. Shame is not its responsibility. It's your responsibility. The shame that you may be living in right now is because you're allowing it to live. And the only thing that kills shame is the blood of Jesus. 
That's it. It's not, I, it's not church attendance. It's not you have done enough stuff for society. It's not about your works. Your works are as filthy rags. See, shame unaddress, it, it, it unaddressed tends to, and it's like as much as we want to try to not address shame, the reality is, is when it goes unaddressed long enough, it tends to lead to more extreme levels of shame, to more extreme levels of hiding and lying, to, to deeper levels of shame. That's how shame works. Shame says, just stay quiet and no one will know. That's how did that play out for David? Hey, just don't let anybody know that you've committed adultery. And he tried to keep it a secret. And he tried to get Uriah to come and sleep with his wife. But Uriah was such a man of integrity that he said, I'm not going to do that because you've trained me to not do that while we're at war. Isn't it interesting that the very thing that David created a culture in backfired on him. And now he's having to deal with and confront. He's trying to keep it a secret. And that secret leads to Uriah being killed. See, in an interest, shame was like, oh, just do this. You'll cover it up. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Well, that didn't work. And so it's another deeper level. Now he's feeling with, now not only did I do that, but now I've killed her husband. And I know those are extremes. And so sometimes we can kind of disconnect from those because they're extremes. Like I'm not going to have necessarily an affair I'm not going to kill someone, but I will overreact, and I will lie, and I may cheat, and I may, you see what I'm saying? But my goal and my whole point for you to understand is that shame never settles for where you're at. Shame always wants more. Shame always wants to get more from you. Shame has this ability to reattach to you even after years of getting through it. Because the enemy uses your past over over you towards your future. I, we really need some more time. Pray that the Lord, y'all give me five minutes. Yes, five more. One, two, three, four, I'm just kidding. All right. Look, shame, shame wants to get you to live in the mistake. It wants you to live in that mistake. It wants you to focus on that and like, wow, I deserve this because of this. That's not what Jesus did. That's not what the Lord did in the garden, right? There was a consequence for the sin, but he didn't make Adam and Eve relive it every day. So here's my last and final point is this, is that shame grows in the darkness and dies in the light of confession. That if you want shame to go away, you need to confess it to the Lord and you may need to confess to somebody else. Because as long as shame can stay in the dark, it's like mold. It grows. It thrives. Where do brown recluse live? Right? Nasty, wet, dark places. Like nothing good grows in the dark, right? Shame doesn't either. Some of y'all just got arachnophobia. <laughs> Um, the, the response to shame is repentance. And I know that's a word that is just kind of foreign to church nowadays. Repentance, what? That's what Adam and Eve finally did as they repented. That's what David did as he repented. He acknowledged his mistake, that it grieved God. And many of us are trying to get out of shame without that thing, without that response. Here's a last and final scripture, just so you, I already kind of said it, but I want to give you the text. Romans 8, 1, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation in those that are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, you can't be in condemnation. It's impossible. It doesn't mean that condemnation doesn't come, but you can't, you don't have, you should not live in condemnation if you are in Christ. Condemnation will come. Shame will come. Those things will come. But they don't have power because of your position in Christ. So you will never fix shame until, you're, until you've brought it to the Lord in humility. See, that's one of the problems with shame is we do it with pride. We handle it as pride. And pride only increases the level of shame. Humility 
is actually what takes us to a place of repentance. Saying, okay, God, pride never sees sin the way that sin should be seen. Humility does. Proverbs 29, 23 says this, you will never, you will never defeat shame. I'm sorry, that, I, that was my point. Let me read this real quick. Because this passage of scripture has always been so good to me. Proverbs 29, 23 says this. Pride ends in humiliation, but check this out, while humility brings honor. You're gonna get humbled one way or the other. Let's not choose humiliation, let's choose humility because humility at least gives me honor. David is the perfect illustration of when he tried to have pride, what did it do? It brought humiliation. But when he finally got humble, it brought honor. We're honor, we honor David today. We don't humiliate him, we honor him because of his response. There's this passage of scripture that God reminded me because many of you feel shame. Maybe even as I've preached about this this morning, shame is brought back up. Because that's kind of how it is, right? The Lord is trying to help you, but the enemy's like, oh, I'm gonna remind you of why you don't deserve this sermon. But in Joel, it says this, yet God promises the impossible. I will restore the years that the locusts has eaten. God is a restorer. It doesn't matter if the decisions you've made have made major repercussions. The power of this whole point is for you to understand shame should not have power over you. That whether you are a young teenager and shame is plaguing you or you are 95 years old and shame is haunting you because of your past, you can be free from that. And this morning, I wanna have the worship team come up and I know that we're pressured for time in this first service, but I'm still gonna make room and space for God to bring the things that he needs to bring to you, just like he brought to Adam and Eve. That some of you, you need to repent. Some of you, you need to have a sense of humility and you need to say, okay, that's me. I need to bring this shame to the Lord because the Lord is the only one who's gonna deal with it the right way. So if you would stand with me this morning. And I wanna do salvation call first because I wanna make space for those of you who wanna really give God an opportunity to to touch your life. And so this morning, if you've never given your life or heart to Jesus, I wanna give you an opportunity to do that by acknowledging that I'm not right with the Lord because I've never given my life or my heart to Him. But this morning, I wanna give my life and my heart to Him. If that's you this morning, if you would, just lift your hand to heaven real quick. I just wanna know who you are so I can be praying for you this week. I give you an opportunity to encounter Christ. You say, that's me. I need to give my life and my heart to Jesus. All right. Now this morning, I want to give you an opportunity. Because some of you all have been living in this shame for years. And God loved you so much that he put this on my heart. Not so that you could stay in the shame, so you could walk out of it and be free. And so this morning, I want to make these altars available between you and God, but there's something about you taking a step towards God in humility. Pride says, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna deal with it. Humility says, I don't wanna deal with it anymore. I want God to restore and redeem me. So I wanna give, I wanna give you space this morning to deal with that, confront that, be freed from that this morning. So if that's you, You can make your way to the altar this morning. And I believe in God that God is going to set so many of you free this morning. The altars are open.